I'm Parker Palmer. Well, I think, you know, I think a lot of my work, Daniel, has been uh, an effort to bring some kind of spiritual insight into a secular world, a secular, in secular settings, universities, public schools, where you build walls instead of bridges if you use an overly religious rhetoric. And so I've spent a lot of time finding other ways to talk about the same things. I mean, I realized higher, uh, in, early on in higher education, I realized that if I started talking about it, <coughs> spirituality, they wouldn't let me in the door. But I could talk about epistemology and engage them and take them to many of the same places. Well, I was born. <clears throat> I was born in Chicago, Illinois, on February twenty eighth, nineteen thirty nine, at St. Luke's Hospital. Um, my dad was a Chicago businessman. He uh, worked uh, for a company that sold chinaware and silverware to restaurants, hotels, railroads, and eventually airlines. Um, lived in the city for a while, and then my parents moved up to the north, northern suburbs first Kenilworth, and then Will Met, where I did a lot of my growing up. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I have two sisters, uh, slightly younger than I. We all went to New Trier High School in Winnetka, Illinois, which served all of those North Shore suburbs. And uh, after graduating from high school in 1957, I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, where I spent four consecutive years, very good years of my life, met some wonderful mentors with whom I am friends to this day. Um, and the thing I always like to say about them is that they were people, all of them men, in whom faith and reason had a very happy relationship. I've never understood the warfare between religion and science, put that in quotes. Um, because I was raised by, I was educated by very smart people for whom that wasn't an issue. But I, I think my mother had a kind of, um, yeah, had a kind of uh, edgy, creative energy that has also um, gifted me um, by, with, with, with things like, um, well, I was the first person in my family to go to college. I always felt out of place in academic environments. I never imagined myself to be a scholar, an intellectual, or a writer. And yet, here I am at age 73, and I've written nine or ten books, and I've made my living doing that. And, um, um, and, and when I look back, I think, that's, that, how did I, how did I, how did I, where did I find the chutzpah to even try to walk that path? And my mother had a lot of chutzpah, so I probably, I probably owe that one. My folks were loyal churchgoers. They were Methodists. Um, and um, my sisters and I went with them to church every Sunday. Um, the preacher, during most of my growing up, was was a fairly stern fellow. This was this was not a conservative or fundamentalist church. It was a sort of middle of the road Methodist church with social concerns as well as uh, concerns about um, about abstinence from alcohol and smoking. Um, but it. it, it, it the, the most important thing that happened to me in growing up at that church happened because of a very remarkable youth director that we had there named Bert Randall, who on weekends um, hosted a youth group that re I think really gave me my first intimations of the beloved community um, or the kingdom of God, as some people say. Um, the, the, the high school that I went to was very socially stratified, as most high schools are. Everybody knew, you know, 
what slot they occupied in that high school. You're a geek or a jock or a hood in those days, the, the auto mechanics kids. Um, but on the weekends with this youth group, we were all one. Um, because of the way Bert Randall moved among us, uh, just treating us with radical equality and radical hospitality, and um, and and cutting through the the social strata that divided us five days a week at high school, and I I I, I didn't know it at the time, but I think that that those youth group meetings, which weren't heavy on theology, they were you know, all about doing stuff and talking about things that are of concern to teenagers. Um, those, those youth group meetings um, gave me um, a, a model of what life could be like, and, and also, I think, a model of, of leadership. Um, I've, I've, I've been interested, for as long as I can remember, in what I think of as creating spaces for different kinds of interactions than we normally have in this society. And a lot of the work I've been doing for the last 15 years through the Center for Courage and Renewal is all about creating generative spaces that allow people to relate differently at a deeper level, not only with each other, but with themselves than is normally possible in our society. And I think that this, this interest in the creation of spaces, the way you form those boundaries, how you lead people once you're in those spaces, really began in many ways with that uh, youth group in the, in the Methodist church. I think the, the while I don't have a lot of memories of, of, of what was preached or taught, at that church in, 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 a, in an explicit way, there are a couple of things that I do remember. I, I remember, first of all, often being moved to tears by the music, by the hymns that, that we sang. Um, they, weren't, they weren't the old-time gospel hymns, but they were some of the great hymns out of the Methodist hymnal. And the, the music reached me in a way that um, um, I think came back to life in later years in the form of, of a love of poetry and the kind of spiritual or religious insights that I can get from poetry. I also remember, I remember certain, certain big ideas from scripture that have always been constitutive of my life. Um, one of them is incarnation, the word become flesh, which of course is a core piece of the Christian tradition. And as a person who's always loved words, and, and I grew up in a family that loved language, my mother especially was a language buff, um, I, I've loved words and yet I've also been aware, especially in academic life, that words can just sort of float above the fray and get disconnected from the human condition. So this, this Christian notion that I started hearing about early on, that the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, that's just always been very compelling for me. And I've always thought, I think that has something to do with how I'm supposed to live my life. Um, I'm, I'm either supposed to you know, find those words that, I'm, that I need to live into, or I have to look at my own living to see what word is being manifested in my living. And is that the word that I want to put out in the world? Because what I embody is more important than what I say. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, grace, forgiveness, those were concepts that meant a lot to me. Um, I, I, I had passages as a young person of, you know, feeling that I was um, 
that I was just that I was different in unacceptable ways, feeling like the odd man out, even though I was a popular kid and I was president of the student council and so forth. It was at a deeper level that I just sort sort of felt not at home in my own skin or not at home in the world. And th these notions of grace and forgiveness, which sort of invited me back to myself and invited me back to, to life on earth, were, were, were very important notions to me. And then later in my adult life, when I wrestled with clinical depression, and some of that younger stuff may have been harbingers of, of a sort of depressive, a sort of a dark thread that's run through my life, which a few times has brought me pretty low. Um, the, 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 those are the passages in which um, the concepts of forgiveness and grace can mean, um, well, they, I was going to say they can mean a very great deal. They can actually mean the difference between life and death, I think, both either, both literally and metaphorically. And, and then one other thing that made a great impression on me uh, when I was a young person listening to the preaching and teaching in my church, and that was a phrase from the New Testament that says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. And I remember when I heard that, thinking that those earthen vessels are things like every theological formulation on the face of the earth, you know, every language set in which we try to talk about God, or they are in our conception of ordained ministry, or they are in our conception of, um, of, of church itself. They are all of the images we have about about who we are as Christians and and how we are holding this treasure. the The mistake we keep making is to confuse the vessel with the treasure. And the vessel is not to be confused with the treasure. The vessel can and must be broken in order to reveal more of the treasure. So, so, which isn't to say that vessels are unimportant. They, they aren't. They carry things down through time, which might otherwise get lost. But at any moment, you ought to be willing to give up the vessel in which you're holding the treasure if it obscures the treasure, which it always does in one way or another. So as a result of this notion that was planted in me at a very early age, I've never understood why some people defend certain theological formulas as if they were God, because they aren't. They are pointers toward God. And if you can find a better pointer, or if you can see that someone else has a different pointer that allows you to look at this great mystery from another angle, or to, to turn the prism on this very complex light which has all kinds of dimensions to it, then that's what you ought to do. You know, you ought to be willing to do that because we have this treasure in earthen vessels precisely to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. So uh, there were a few concepts that came to me through preaching and teaching that um, turned out to be pretty important on my, on my spiritual journey. You know, I really, I, I really, right off the top of my head, I really can't remember a particular story, it because it almost feels to me like it, 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 like it's asking a fish to tell you the story of water. You know, it's just the medium that I that I swim in, and um, I think I think only by looking back, and probably because I've been a writer for many many years and have been trying to articulate. Um, this stuff o only so can I can I name it um, as as kind of the constant flow of of my life. As I say, it 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 
it has been challenged by experiences of failure and experiences of clinical depression, of times in deep darkness when I wasn't sure it was it was worth living anymore. Um, and I've been there and done that uh, three major times in my life now. And and so I, uh, I I know what it's like to not only be lost in the dark, but to feel that one has become the dark, uh, which is um, really different from being lost in the dark. The the experience of depression is really an experience of sort of the annihilation of self. Uh, when you're lost in the dark, you still have a self that you can use to navigate and negotiate and try to grope your way towards some light. But when you become the dark, um, you don't have anything to work with. And and then it's... And, and, and all all semblance of religious faith or um, or a feeling of God's presence just disappears. Um, and um, and I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've written about my depression in various places, including Let Your Life Speak, and I, I remember writing in Let Your Life Speak a, a line that goes something like this, um, people, I hear people say, I don't understand why so-and-so committed suicide. I understand perfectly. They needed the rest. Um, depression, it, it, becoming the dark is, is an exhausting and utterly demoralizing experience, and you need the rest. I understand that. What I don't understand is how some people are able to come through depression and find themselves more alive and more whole on the other side. I don't understand the mystery of tenacity or whatever you want to call it that allows some people to go through that profound experience and find themselves back in the light with a better life than the one they had before. That's the real mystery to me. And I genuinely don't know. Um, I, I have absolutely no advice to give anybody about how to do that, because I don't know how it happens. Grace is the only word I can fall back on. I think the best I can say is that God is a word that points to the reality in which we're all embedded. And it's a reality that is... That um, that unconditionally loves us, that is filled with charged expectancy that calls to us, um, and in which, I mean, I think there's one more element to be added to this, in which we're not the only show in town. And I think that's an important piece to add. The, there have only been a couple of times in my life when I've had anything that vaguely resembles a sort of a classic mystical experience. The, the one that's coming to me at the moment was when I was hiking some years ago on the high desert in New Mexico at the foot of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And I had gone out by myself from this center where I was staying, and I was, I was in a location where you couldn't see anything that was made by human beings. Um, and in the midst of this desert, under this startlingly blue sky, with these mountains on the horizon, and not the far horizon, fairly near, um, I, I suddenly had this sense that the universe um, is utterly indifferent to me, and the universe is utterly accepting of me. And, and it, it felt like a moment of, of touching some kind of 
what the philosophers would call ontological bedrock, you know, just the nature of being. And it was that combination of the humility that comes with knowing that this vast reality is utterly indifferent to me, and that it is at the same time utterly accepting of me, that just created a feeling of freedom about the living of my life and and the preciousness of my life, of life itself, um, that, um, that probably comes about as close as I can to, to naming or to defining the word God or, or what God, what that word means to me or what my image of God is. You know, I, I think I was attracted to Quakerism, which is a form of Christianity that has no clergy, at least in my branch of Quakerism, no clergy, no formal theology in which the Bible is regarded as a sacred text, but so are a lot of other texts. The, the, the canon never closed for Quakers. There are poets and other writers today who are writing, who are writing revelation, you know, God's revelation. Um, I think I was attracted to that because Quakers practice silent worship. They don't try to wrap a lot of words around the religious experience. They, they stand in a stream uh, that's known to scholars of spirituality as, as epiphatic uh, spirituality, which is imageless spirituality, as opposed to cataphatic spirituality, which, in, for example, uses icons as foci of meditation. So it's not to say that one is worthwhile and the other isn't. It's just to say that for some people, and I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people, um, I, I have a need to treat very lightly all ways, all the ways of naming God, which is another way of saying to, to take all of them very seriously as turns of the prism and not to fixate or lock in on any one. Um, every word, including the word God, for me, is a pointer towards a reality that absolutely eludes language. And the minute you confuse that reality with your language or anybody else's language, I think you've made um, a dangerous mistake because then you're, you're start, you start clinging to a formula rather than swimming in the water of life. I think it goes back to that, that childhood moment of realizing the importance of the, of the phrase, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Well, I think, I think God has a wild side. I, I, in fact, I don't have any question about it. I don't think God's a Methodist or a Quaker. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't think God is affiliated with a denomination because, because there's, a, there's a chaotic uh, dimension to the, to the God reality. Um, that I mean, sometimes I look at the photographs taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and I see that 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 you know that chaotic beauty. And I know it's astronomy, but I also think it's theology. You know, I think it's I think it's God um, bringing order out of chaos, and then taking that which is ordered and returning it to chaos in order 
to pull off the next creative act. And my mother was big on the chaos side. My father was big on the order side. And I think, you know, between the two of them, I think, for me, there's, there's a sort of fuller picture of, of, again, of the nature of the reality in which we're embedded. I, I, obviously, for me, a big thing is that it isn't reality over here and God out there somewhere. Um, they're one and the same. Um, uh, I remember, I remember um, growing up hearing my preacher uh, inveigh against, as many preachers used to do and still do, inveigh against all those people who are out there worshiping nature on Sunday instead of being in church. Well, my wife and I just returned from 12 days in New Mexico where we did a fair amount of hiking in the mountains. And, you know, you see this wild, untamed beauty. And it's, it's God. I mean, it's holy. It's, it's, it evokes reverence. Um, e evokes reverence more for me than religious services often do. And, um, and I just, I think that, you know, um, Einstein says God does not roll the dice. Ah, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I hate to disagree with Einstein, but I think, I think there's that element of, of um, chaotic disorder in the reality in which we're embedded that we need to learn to dance with and that we need to learn to admit into our own lives. As I said, my dad was very much a middle-of-the-road guy and very much in charge of his own emotions. If, if I would fault my dad for anything, it was that he never let his emotions show his favorite, one of his favorite sayings was every day's Thanksgiving. And, and so, you know, there's always um, a shadow side to any gift or legacy. And for me, one of the shadow sides of being my father's son is that when I got into my late teens and early 20s and started experiencing difficult feelings around my own failures, my own instincts, my own impulses, my own life, um, I felt that I was falling short of what it meant to be a real man. Because a real man would be right down the middle of the road and every day would be Thanksgiving. Well, I had a lot of days that weren't Thanksgiving at all. Or if they were, they were the Thanksgiving from hell. Um, and, and I thought, you know, I'm there must be something wrong with me. And it took me some years to, to understand that I needed to honor the shadow side in my own life. Um, and I needed um, to, to use that, that darkness and that dark energy as, as part of my own work as in writing and teaching and speaking. And it's, it's been very interesting to me that, you know, of all the things I've written, um, some of the pieces that get the most response are about the shadow side. The, the, cha the single chapter on depression in Let Your Life Speak um, is, is a fairly brief piece but I hear about it from lots and lots and lots of people. You know, thank you for going public with this. Thank you for framing it the way you did. Thank you for helping me understand myself or helping me understand the person I love or care about who's going through this experience right now more better than I did before. Well, yeah, I, I, there's a couple of stories that at least hint at something, both, uh, both, both in terms of uh, 
the challenge and the potential. So in my first depression, um, and depression is often accompanied by radical insomnia, I was awake again, you know, for what seemed like the the 40th night in a row, uh, just exhausted by my inability to get sleep. And, and, uh, and I just, I have this memory of in the middle of the night, I have no idea what time it was, it was probably after midnight, hearing, put quotes around that word, hearing, a voice say very simply to me, I love you, Parker. Um, I didn't literally hear it as, as you're now hearing me or I'm hearing myself, but those words somehow rose up in me. And, and while, I, while I heard them and while I believed them, they didn't turn me around. Um, it's the only time that I've, that I've ever heard a message that way. Um, and, and they probably planted a seed in me that slowly, slowly grew, but I didn't sleep again the next night or the next night or the next night. They happened, they were real, they were meaningful, but they weren't magical. Um, and so that was a glimpse. That was a glimpse, and I can't say, you know, what the next weeks or months would have been like if I hadn't heard them. So maybe they planted a seed. In any event, I'm grateful. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the other story has to do with an afternoon when I was sitting right here on this couch, um, where I'm facing a window through which the late afternoon sun comes. And um, it's important to know in this, in this story that, that for the Quakers, that there's great meaning in, in the phrase when someone says to you, I will hold you in the light. Um, that's a, a, almost the same as someone saying, I will pray for you. I will hold you in the light for well-being or whatever. So one afternoon, Sharon, my wife, was out of the house to go, I think, shopping for a while. And um, I was sitting here. It was, I think, a summer day, and it was a late summer day, and it was, I don't know, 5 o'clock, 5.30. And the sun was coming right in that window. And I, I, I actually remember moving a little to, to sit in the middle of it because it was, it just felt good. And Sharon came in the house and walked in here and said something like, um, what are you doing? And I said, I'm holding myself in the light. <laughs> And we both laughed, and, 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 and what we recognized in the moment, and I really felt inside, was just the capacity to make a little joke like that meant that, that I was turning, that, that I was coming out of the darkness, or the darkness was coming out of me. Sometimes I think humor is, I think tears are a gift from God. I think humor is a gift from God. Um, I just think that, you know, that, that there are all these kind of amazing, often small ways, like that flicker of wild original life way deep in the woods. Um, that we have of sort of rekindling that that spark and you know coming back to well-being. Well, you know when 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 your faith is 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 uh, 
when the best metaphor you have for it is um, uh, that you're like the fish who swims in water and doesn't know it, I think probably my my periods of doubt about faith were were those periods when I when I felt like I just had to go it alone and um, there wasn't there wasn't uh, anything for me in the world except my own effort and resourcefulness and wit and wile and that all of that had had run out and failed me um, I mean I can remember a time in graduate school when I was fired from a research assistant job when I really you know I thought my career was over um, I can I can remember another time when I was a community organizer in Washington when I inadvertently made an an enemy in in Washington D.C. who who was fond of saying things like I can turn off your water in this town anytime I want to and I believed him you know in other words it, it was time these were times when I when I lost confidence that, or when I, when I forgot that I was swimming in a big ocean where no one can turn off the water, or when I forgot that the water itself can buoy me up even when I can't actively swim. Um, and so, so those were the times that, that I guess, for me, there would be a loss of faith. There, there was also a passage in my life when I first moved to Pendle Hill. I think I think I um, I was not I, I was not nearly as articulate. I was not at all articulate about this fish in the water thing as I as I am today. And, and my, my religious faith was more an intellectual construct that I had learned through religion courses in college, through a year at Union Theological Seminary, and then through some studying at Berkeley. And, and when I moved to Pendle Hill, um, my Christian faith was, was highly conceptual. Um, I could talk a better theological game than I can today, and I had to because that's about all I had going for me. Um, so at Pendle Hill, we worshipped every morning in the silence, Quaker style. And at first, I thought this is going to be wonderful because um, I had. I was a great Thomas Merton fan. I had read about monasticism and monastic silence, and I thought that's that's that sounds great to me. But my first few months at Pendle Hill, I just the, the, the silent meeting for worship every morning made me angrier and angrier and angrier. And I expressed my anger. I'm like the anger was about well, I'm not hearing anything in here that sounds like you know the the word of god to me or sounds like you know what what i had heard at seminary or what i had heard in church i expressed my anger to some elders in the quaker community and they very very gently sort of inquired into it like what is that really about parker and under their loving questioning Nobody preaching at me, nobody trying to persuade me, just asking me what was going on. I started to realize that, that the anger was really about the fact that in that silence, when my intellectual construction of faith was not being propped up by the words of the, the minister or the professor, um, the whole thing was 
falling apart around my head. What I thought was my faith was crumbling and collapsing. And so the first thing I had to do was to let that happen. Um, and then to start to realize what the Quakers meant when they said that, that, that the whole basis of their faith tradition has to do with what it is you can, you can claim experientially. Not, not what, it, what it is you know intellectually, but what it is that you can claim experientially out of your own life journey. Um, there's a famous little couplet in Quakerism written by a guy named Sidney Carter, who's, who also wrote a, a well-known song called Lord of the Dance. Uh, Sidney Carter, an English Quaker, who said, your holy hearsay is not evidence. Give me the good news in the present tense. <laughs> and, and for Quakers, that's a big principle. Just because it says it in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. Or just because some great theologian or rabbi or teacher said it, it ain't necessarily so. But if you can say it out of your own experience of the divine, or in my case, of the water you swim in, then, then you may be on to something. We have to test that in the community and so forth, but you may be on to something. So after I understood that and had allowed my constructed faith to fall apart around me, I was able to use that same Quaker silence to reflect very deeply on what it was I knew experientially. And that's when words like grace and forgiveness and embodiment, the word become flesh, um, all of that began to, uh, and, and renewal, redemption, salvation, all of that be, began to come back to me, but not because I'd gotten it out of some book, but because it resonated with, with my life experience. Um, you know, I realized by then that um, that experience that I mentioned a moment ago in, in, of losing a job in graduate school where I thought my life was, my professional life was going to come to an end, and maybe my personal life too, um, that there had actually been a grace about that that had led me down a different and better path that had more to do with my gifts and, and how I'm called to use them in the world. Well, this is a poem called Harrowing that I wrote somewhere in the middle of my second experience with depression. I was out in the country at a retreat center for about a week, and it was spring, and I was walking down a country road and saw this plowed up field. And this poem came to me about the scene before my eyes and about what was going on inside of me as well. Um, it's, it's another one of those uh, experiences that planted a seed in me that grew over time. And, um, I think helped helped heal me from this particular depression over over the long haul called harrowing. The plow has savaged this sweet field, misshapen clods of earth kicked up, rocks and twisted roots exposed to view, last year's growth demolished by the blade. I have plowed my life this way, turned over a whole history, looking for the roots of what went wrong, until my face is ravaged, furrowed, scarred. Enough. The job is done. Whatever has been uprooted, let it be seedbed for the growing that's to come. I plowed to unearth last year's reasons 
the farmer plows to plant a greening season.